<laughs> oh, hello there. So glad you could come along. I am the Dream Finder. <laughs> Choose another story. Then <laughs> push my nose when you're ready to hear how the story goes. <laughs> go ahead and push my nose. W, w Radio, your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 659, and together we're going to celebrate the magic of the Disney parks, movies, and more here on the podcast, my weekly live video community, videos, books, audio tours, and more. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast and find everything else at www.radio.com. So Walt Disney not only personally loved America, but showcased it on screen and in the Disney parks, but Walt's connection goes far deeper, and this week we share 10 things you didn't know about Walt Disney and Washington. From Disney and the President to Walt's widow Lillian, to Walt working for and with the U.S. government, Disney in the Supreme Courts, the Department of Defense, and Walt's secret connection to the FBI, and much more. I'll then have the answer to our Disney Trivia Question of the Week and post more updates at the end of the show, including a change to our weekly live video broadcast. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. If you could see close in my eyes, the American flag is waving in both of them. And up my spine is growing this red, white, and blue stripe. A quote from Walt Disney is one of my favorites. And Walt himself is possibly the, the consummate example of the American dream. From his early struggles and adversity growing up in the American Midwest to the spirit of innovation and opportunity and creativity Walt didn't just embrace that American spirit, but I think he really became a shining example of it. And that patriotism that Walt had was on display, shining display, um, since his childhood when he dressed up as Abraham Lincoln and recited the Gettysburg Address to his class and then other classes in his school. Um, his admiration of, of Abraham Lincoln that started at an early age and obviously was, was further exampled in this great moments with Mr. Lincoln show at Disneyland. And he would go on to take his love of America and the American dream and folklore into films and, and characters like Pecos Pill and Johnny Appleseed and Paul Bunyan and Casey Jones and Little Hiawatha, Johnny Tremaine, the great mo locomotive trace, chase, Westward Ho, the ragged wagons, the list goes on and on. And on TV, even even he brought some of those American historical folk figures to life with, you know, Davy Crockett and, and Daniel Boone and Texas John Slaughter. And really to the parks, you know, he's even, it's even said that Disneyland is sort of that, that love letter to America. He said it would be a world of Americans, past and present, seen through the eyes of my imagination, a place of warmth and nostalgia, of illusion and color and delight. And we had, that's why we have places like Main Street USA and Frontierland and New Orleans Square, Liberty Square, and what was supposed to be Edison Square that really sort of bring about that love and respect and of, of America and American history. But what you might not know is that in addition to his personal love of our nation in his heart and on screen and in the parks around the world, Disney also has another American, not adventure, but connection to our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And this week, I am joined by my longtime friend and now author of the new book, Walt Goes to Washington, Jamie Hecker, as we talk about 10-ish things you didn't know 
about Walt and Washington. Jamie, my friend, it is so good to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Luke, for having me on. This has uh, been a long passion project of mine writing this book, and getting to talk about it is is the next exciting challenge in my in this book. So thank you for having me on so I can share this with your listeners. So, uh, look, I, I think that all good stories start with an origin story. Give me a little bit about yours. Give me a little bit about Jamie Hecker, his love for, for Disney, and how it went from the, this love that you had to these this, to this desire to write and then this passion project that I know, you know, takes a very, very long time to go from dream to reality. Sure, sure. I, I'm a, I won't reveal my age, but I'm in the demographics where I'm not on TikTok. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I grew up watching uh, the, the wonderful world at Disney on, I think at the time it was NBC. They, they focused on the monorail loop at Walt Disney World. And the two coolest things I remember was the monorail going through the contemporary and the Polynesian pool. And that, that to me was the height of luxury. So our first family trip was 1979. I think that's when the, uh, the Disney bug hit me, hit me hard. And uh, pre-internet, you just, you do what you can to accumulate knowledge and history and find peer groups. And as an adult uh, with kids, that became a, a regular feature of our, our family vacations. And every time I was there, I wanted to learn more, not so much about what the latest attraction was, but more the history of the parks and history of the man. So that is where you start to dig and, and you're, you get more discriminating with your resources and, and you, you find the books uh, that have been published beforehand. Uh, Jeff Curdy, Since the World Began, published in 1925. That should be on everyone's bookcase. I, I know it's out of print, but it's hard to find. So I've always considered myself to be an artist at some level. Uh, and I will give a hat tip to you. Back in 2007, when you and Tim started Celebrations Magazine, you were soliciting for writers. And uh, we were at Disney World preparing for our third cruise. And uh, I thought, huh, maybe I could write about the Disney Cruise Line. So I, I sent you an email. We went on the ship. We got back. You would replied by then. He goes, that's a great idea. What's your angle? My like, God, I hadn't thought about an angle. What am I doing here? <laughs> and in the ble- blessing of, of, of hindsight, I, I, I came across your kryptonite. I said, how about I write about dining on the Disney Cruise Line? <laughs> and uh, so I, you ran that past Tim. You and Tim took a flyer on me. And uh, I've been writing for celebrations for the past decade now. So that is sort of where the mid-step is. Uh, celebrations, it's a... I'll talk about it later. It's it's a wonderful magazine. Tim does a superb job with it. I focus on writing about uh, the men and women who are Disney legends and uh, who have made and shaped the company as it is today. And on the sidebar, I've lived in the D.C. area since 89. I, I worked on Capitol Hill for about six years. I've uh, been working as an IT consultant um, for the past 20 plus years. I've seen plenty of Disney's highlights the lincoln memorial uh the u.s capitol been to the white house um plenty of the smithsonian's library of congress uh been to the national mall countless times my wife and i got proposed at the uh, proposed marriage of, at the steps of the lincoln memorial so that's a personal connection for me and this notion that a disney story was was out there had just been ruminating through my head for years i couldn't tell if it was going to be an article it was too much, too dense to be an article. Would it be a series of blogs, possibly? How do you, main, moment, momentum is, is hard. Once you start, you gotta, gotta finish. The opportunity presented itself with COVID of all things. Uh, everybody had their own, and is still going through their own uh, challenge with, with day-to-day living with COVID. Um, real quick sidebar, I, in 2019, I was diagnosed with a blood cancer. It did not keep me from working. Um, but when COVID came, the, the rules all were thrown out. So I went out on disability. I'm grateful for my employer for that. Uh, my wife stepped up and it's gone full time. And I have two adult sons who are in college locally. They each took a, some time off to be work as my caregiver. And um, that had gave me the window of opportunity to research and write. And as what any, what you probably can 
uh, you can probably tell, research is about 75%. 25 is the rest, the actual writing. And um, COVID turned out to be a double-edged sword. I, I couldn't get out of the house. Everything in the early days was in furlough slash shutdown. So I couldn't visit facilities for on-hands research. And so I, I drafted my outline. I reached out to a lot of friends who are subject matter experts on the area. I got a good friend who's a Supreme Court enthusiast. He gave me some background information that I did not have. And uh, it just relied on parsing through a lot of publicly available records. I'm gracious that the D23 website exists because a lot of the uh, archive related information hosted on D23, I could attribute to the archives. Having said all that, let's dive in. Yeah, I, I think, again, there, there are so many great facts and details and stories in the book. And I want to sort of go through 10-ish of some okay. of the most interesting, some of your favorites, because I think it, it's it's really fascinating to me, again, how the connection between Disney and, and DC and Disney and the government and, and the people is not just sort of seen in some of the places we've talked about, but really goes a lot deeper. So go ahead and start sharing, you know, your, your first of some of your 10 favorite okay. facts. Yeah, well, I open up the book with some outlines about the history of Washington, D.C., its its origin. I'll let readers digest that because that's not Walt specific, but let's dive into Walt and the U.S. presidents. Walt was Walt Disney Brothers Incorporated in 1923, now later to Walt Disney Productions, now the Walt Disney Company. So it's been in the public eye since 1923. Virtually every president in Walt's career has had a, has, has participated in, in Disney in, in some form or another, be it a fundraiser, being a visit to the park after they're out of office. It's sort of a nuanced answer to that question. Um, uh, Herbert Hoover, is one of the exceptions. That was early in. That was before um, Mickey Mouse. Well, actually, at the time of Mickey Mouse, really. Uh, the earliest goes back to, goes back to FDR. Um, I will touch on a few others quickly here. Senator Kennedy, before he was president, did make a, a visit to Disneyland. President Eisenhower, after he retired. But I think the two most telling stories I have talk about the Hall of Presidents every four or eight years. Those are updated uh, since 1971. And in 1972, uh, WDI had the opportunity to retool the show as we know it. They gave the, the, the sitting president a featured speaking role uh, about a minute and a half. And there's a, a great story in my book talks about the tea from WDI that travels out to Washington. They pre-write a script. The script gets revised. They have to go through the White House and uh, to find the best room from an acoustics perspective. They get the recording equipment set up and it's uh, it's well documented how President Clinton is counting down and he starts singing uh, When You Wish Upon a Star. Uh, and it's, it's a neat story. Everyone, all the WDA managers are pinching themselves that they're caught up in this moment. Uh, that's been a tradition that has continued since and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice feature in the book. Uh, the uh, Imagineering Internal has, a, has its own newsletter. I did get a few copies of that. That story was included. That was my source. So I'm grateful for, uh, for those folks who document their work because uh, otherwise it gets lost to, uh, to, to um, retirements and lost to the memory. So the other famous presidential story, I think everyone knows this, but I'll reiterate it. Um, Presidential phrases are sound bites can be part of the American zeitgeist. You start thinking of FDR with, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. John F. Kennedy says, we choose to go to the moon. President Lincoln at his Gettysburg address begins four score and 70 years ago. Ronald Reagan, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. We, we don't know always what the context is, but we understand it's, a, it's an inflection point in American culture. And there's a, some significance behind it. And one of the uh, uh, more poorly chosen words uttered by a U.S. president was, was uh, Richard Nixon at the 1974 Associated Press Convention at the Contemporary Resort. 
during a question and answer session with AP reporters, he's trying to clear his name. Um, during the Watergate scandal, he, he blurts out, I am not a crook. Well, there's more to it than that. He was talking about his, uh, his background investments, his, his, his book deal he had, how he had been cleaning up his, um, his bank accounts to, to uh, present to the public that he was you know, ethical and, and honorous with his, his uh, non-presidential funds. But those four words stuck. And uh, that kind of tarnished his, his presidency. You know, it's not uh, the Beatles. We know how the Beatles officially broke up at the Polynesian, but you can make the argument that the, the tipping point of the, uh, the Nixon presidency was at the Contemporary Resort. And you can actually still go. It actually happened in the Ballroom of the Americas, where you could actually yes. still go and literally stand, you know, not that this is like your, your most desirable photo op, but you can sort of recreate <laughs> it in, uh, in the Ballroom of the Americas at the Contemporary Resort. And it's interesting because when you talk about Disney and the president, I started thinking about, because I get this actually question all the time, is what presidents have actually visited the Disney yes. Park? And, and I know sort of the technically the first president to visit was Harry S. Truman, but he actually didn't do it during the, the, the time of his presidency because Disneyland yeah. didn't exist. And it wasn't it until right, a, right. a couple of years later. And I was trying to think of the because even like um, uh, JFK visited Disneyland, yes. but yep. not That's when he was a president. He was, right. He was a senator. And I guess really Nixon visiting in. Uh, when he visited in, in, in 1971, he was the, the first sitting president to actually visit the parks. And then later, yes, I, um, uh, I know Jimmy Carter Rick, visited, Ronald Rick, Reagan visited, yes. Obama Bush. visited. I was I, I was there in Obama back in uh, in 2012 when he gave yeah. his speech in um, in in on Main Street USA with on Main Street. Yes. Yeah, with Cinderella Castle behind. And uh, and when when um, Nixon was vice president under under Eisenhower, he did um, a lot of duties at Disneyland. He helped open up the 1959 Tomorrowland uh, uh, re monorail reopening, the famous Bob Gurr story about how he, <laughs> he hijacked the vice president for a loop around the monorail line. Uh, you'll see that in the book. But yeah, it's Reagan and Nixon, by virtue of their Republican affiliation with, with the Walt Disney and their Southern California roots, those two gentlemen, those two presidents have the most connections to Disney parks. And that's uh, well documented in, in the book. I'll let my readers uh, explore that further. And I know um, I know Clinton visited and George W. visited, but they never actually they never actually stepped foot in the park. Right. I think, I think Clinton went. I, Clinton, I think, spoke at like the Disney Institute and George uh, W. gave close. a speech at one of the resorts. Yeah. Yes. Uh, George W. Bush did a. Uh, the first Bush did a, a thousand points of light speech at uh, one of the resorts. The Clinton story, I'll circle back to that because every source I came across says he visited the Disney Institute and there was no further context, no more meat on that bone. So I went to the Clinton library to get the presidential daily schedule. I um, eventually cross-checked it with um, uh, the Orlando Sentinel archives. He and at that time, uh, Vice President Gore were circling Florida on, on a um, particular tour initiative. And uh, President um, Clinton's last stop of the day was in Orlando. About 10.30 p.m., his, his motorcade drives over to the Disney Institute, what was then, now uh, Disney Springs. Sorry, uh, Saratoga Springs. Checks into a hotel room about 10.30 and leaves the next morning at 8. <laughs> so that was it. He, he was there. He probably uh, tuned in, uh, watched a little TV, got got a good night's rest, and then left for the day. So uh, I thought there would be an exciting story there, a little <laughs> anticlimactic, but at least I got to the I got to the bottom of it. Right, I can say that say that he was here, but the Disney connection goes not just to you know the parks and the presidents and and Walt and and and, and presidents and, and his love of America, but it also extends to and I and I actually found this fascinating. I never knew this before. That it also extends to his wife, his widow Lillian, as well. Yes, because she was the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Yes, yes, this is honored by Congress. Uh, Congress has, <clears throat> by by 
uh, required by my bipartisan majority will honor American heroes. A lot of them are war heroes. The first one was uh, George Washington. He took me to the Wright brothers, uh, Jonas Salk, famous Americans. Walt was sort of a no-brainer to get this medal. And he is uh, deceased at this time. Uh, Lillian, on his behalf, the medal is actually presented by the president, even though it's issued by Congress. And uh, it's a, there's a White House ceremony. This is the other fun fact I learned. Uh, Blaine Gibson <clears throat> sculpted the coin. Uh, we, we know Blaine is a three-dimensional sculpture for sculptor for uh, iconic presidents and iconic uh, and audio animatronics, but he did a two-dimensional bass relief on a coin. Um, it's, I think the gold coin was issued and uh, for Lillian, it's probably in their, their family possession and additional copies were, were minted as well. But that is um, the quote, the, the story, the presentation from Nixon to, uh, uh, to Lillian is in my book. I've got the full quote there. Um, that is something I did not know. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Speaking of Lillian, I learned something utterly new about her as well. We know the story of Walt and Roy. We know the story of... Uh, Roy E. Disney, the, the company's growth, its trials and tribulations. Lillian Disney was largely um, part of the story, but she was not a corporate board member. Uh, what, I, what I learned during this is that she remarried several years after Walt passed away to a California real estate developer named John Tryons. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's uh, life goes on. And the reason that's significant is because <clears throat> Lillian Disney Tryons is, is named in a Supreme Court case. I'm, I'm jumping ahead to our uh, third branch of government here. Um, Walt's estate on his death stipulated that 45% of his assets be uh, sold for the purpose of CalArts. Uh, CalArts was the uh, artist institution uh, between Charnard, I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure, and the... Uh, in other institutions in California. Anyway, so it comes along that Walt wants the campus the, to have more money. So they are building a campus north of LA in Valencia, California. Lillian does her due diligence as the executor of the will and sells 45% of Walt Disney production stock. And this case turns on the dry arcane work of tax law. <laughs> um, she, and her bank, Bank of California, treated it as a charitable contribution, which would be taxed at a lower rate. Uh, the IRS said, no, this is a long-term capital gain. You owe us more. She ended up paying the difference and took them to court and uh, wound its way up to the Supreme Court. In the end, uh, the court did not favor in, uh, in, in, in terms of Lillian. She did owe that extra amount she was owed, but... I think the major takeaway is that we know a little bit more about her personal life and that we got Cal Arts campus, which opened up its character animation department in 1975 in room A113. So uh, a lot of Pixar and, and Disney animators will do that inside nod to the park, to, to that room as an homage to their, their Disney instructors. Uh, I think Ali Johnson and Frank Thomas were part of the, uh, the original teaching crew on that. Switching gears a little bit, as you like to say, from Walt specifically, Walt, Walt and Lillian and, and the parks, one of the things that I never realized, you know, we know that Walt and Lillian loved to travel. Yes. Um, and and if you and one of the reasons why I love, uh, for example, Riviera and the Voyager's Lounge is because they really sort of highlight and document a lot of Walt and Lillian's travels around the world. And I think one, people, one thing, Jamie, people don't realize is I think know, we know a lot about their goodwill tour that they did yes. Um, yes. back in 40, 41, somewhere around there. And it's it's one of the things that led to the three caballeros and saludos amigos. I never realized, I think a lot of people, that this was not something that was just a, a planned vacation by Walt and some of his artists and Imagineers, but this was something that actually had a direct connection and correlation with the U.S. government. Yes, it did. Yeah, it's... Uh... For the longest time, I had operated under the assumption that it was the U.S. State Department that initiated this. Uh, I was wrong. 
there is a, during the war, I'll, I'll do a little quick setup here. Um, Nelson Rockefeller, uh, American business uh, family and future vice president, had business interests in South and Central America. And he could see the, foresee the, the scope creep of European communism, uh, Nazism, potentially taking root in South America. And he wanted the U.S. presidency to, to help with the goodwill policy towards South America. And so President FDR, through executive order, established... It's the Office of the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. Uh, Ameri- it, just, it rolls it off is. the tongue, yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's why I had to quick look it up. This was stood up with a modest budget. They were uh, housed in the U.S. Commerce Department building. Um, they had a meager budget, and their mission was to send American celebrities to South America to generate goodwill. You look at Bing Crosby, uh, who went, um, American director, uh, b- b- uh, American composer Aaron Copeland went, uh, the American Ballet Company went, but the highlight was was Walt and his his group of 19, uh, uh, El Grupo, as they were nicknamed. It was Mary Blair, uh, Walt and Lillian, to, to drop a few household names, Herb Ryman, and they were there to capture the flavor of South America. The original contract with the, um, with the office called for 12 one reel films. And there were also there's some secondary goals of, of educational um, uh, material. And as work progressed, Walt says, we're gonna pivot here. Um, this is during the war years when the studio was, was in lean operations working for, for the military and a lot of the men and women were, were in the US Army. So putting together single reels was more of a, an effort. So the concept of package films came out about this time. And the first one, Saludos Amigos, was it was, it was a combination of the first three requirements of single reels. And that came out to a, a great, great reception. Disney followed up with The Three Caballeros, which had more of a, a narrative through line featuring Donald Duck celebrating his birthday. Uh, if you haven't watched these, they're on Disney Plus. Go out, check them out again. The animation has stood up. Some of the storylines haven't, but the animation is top notch. And the Three Caballeros also incorporated, for its time in the, in the mid early '40s, a lot of live action animation. Um, we think of the classic Mary Poppins. That was 20 years later. Uh, all the effortless look and uh, the filming of the book with the hot lights on the actresses to uh, to get the right um, saturation levels so that the animators could fill in between. It, it took its toll on the uh, on the crew. I will uh, mention J.B. Kaufman's book, uh, South of the Border. This is a great resource if you want to learn more about, about the, the package films and the El Grupo trip, as well as the documentary El Grupo. There was a third film organized and planned. It was going to be called um, Carnival or, or Cuban carnival. At this point, however, the war is winding down. The influence of the OCIAA is waning. Uh, A lot of its duties are either being um, taken away, removed, or transferred to the State Department. So the extent we have for carnival is some Mary Blair concept artwork she did when she visited Havana in 1944, 1945. Uh, the film was never realized, but it was on the books. And uh, I think when you combine these these two package films along with some other contemporaries like Make My Music and, and Melody Time, you realize that Walt was a businessman and an artist. He had to adapt to the times. And uh, well, I think the thing that's fascinating about the, this this Goodwill tour is is in a number of different areas. One that when the government realizes that sending ambassadors down there, political ambassadors down there, wasn't necessarily working anymore, the fact that they lean on somebody like Walt Disney is, I think, both brilliant and and very, very interesting on a number of levels. Yes, yes. And the fact that Walt was able to take this and say, there's opportunity here for us to not only listen and learn, but create content, it really ended up being... A, a win-win on both sides, and I think you know, as obviously your your book goes into into much greater detail because so many, especially in places like Brazil, 
where yes. they knew more about Walt than they did their own government and the, and the own president of their government. And I think this this tour that he took through places like Argentina, et cetera, yep. and what he was able to do for the government as well as what he was able to do for the studio was incredible. But that this is the part of the thing that, that really fascinated me about your book and your research, Jamie, was Walt's not just his relationship with and how he was sort of called on by the government to help in a number of different ways. So here you have this new sort of branch that would that was reached out for the the inter-American affairs, but it was mm-hmm. also reached out to by the Department of Defense in yes. terms yes. of actual military efforts. And I think you know I think a lot of us know about um, some of the the. The, the art and stuff that he'd done and, and even some of the animation, but it really went on for for a relatively long time in terms of Walt creating content for the military and, and the American government to help sort of further some efforts that were much deeper than just entertainment. So, Jamie, take us through, you know, briefly take us through the connection between Disney and the Department of Defense. Sure, sure. So again, an important uh, caveat is to step back in time to 1940s. The Department of Defense as we know it today was not formally structured until 1947. The the, the dominant branches of the military were the Navy, Department of of, uh, the Navy, and the Army, which went by the Department of the War. Uh, the Air Force was was a stepchild uh, adopted under the Army as the Army Air Corps. I think the Marines fell under the um, the Navy. So the, the dominant military thinking at the time was military strength through naval power and ground troops. Uh, yes, airplane uh, manufacturing was part of it. In fact, uh, right after Pearl Harbor, the Disney studio in Burbank was briefly taken over by the army to protect a nearby Lockheed Martin or maybe just Lockheed facility that was manufacturing uh, uh, aircraft. And the studio overnight turned into a a war propaganda machine. John Hench will recall stories about how some members had to have security clearances to uh, be able to do animation on on Axis warplanes. But uh, it was how to identify aircraft from the ground based on the fuselage, the tail signatures, uh, you know, enemy or friendly fire. And uh, they were also doing homemade animation for uh, American industry, uh, the exciting world of riveting and double riveting on, on aircraft assembly. It's the Disney touch. So they, they put their stamp wholehearted into this. And uh, there were a number of cartoon shorts featuring, um, a lot of them featured uh, uh, Donald Duck, and his and his the longtime Disney nemesis uh, Pete as the drill master, they were done for humor and cheeky fun, but they were all trying to boost the American morale for the war. And I think the biggest comment I'd like to share is that Walt, as an individual, was heavily influenced by uh, a book titled "Victory Through Air Power" by a, a, a former Russian, now naturalized U.S. citizen, Alexander Dissevrinsky. Um, he advocated that to win a global war, army and, and uh, military lines can easily be cut off. The enemy can choke any advances. You need to have superiority from above to strike. And Walt bought into this notion completely to the point where he uh, self-funded the stu- uh, a live action slash um, animation feature called Victory Through Air Power. It went against the military doctrine at the time. He did not have the, the full support of the Pentagon. Uh, he went ahead with it anyway. The traditional distributor at the time was RKO Pictures. Uh, they opted not to release those one. This is the only Disney film that was released by United Artists. And uh, Walt was on a visit to, to, to Washington on many times during the war years. He stayed at his favorite hotel, the Mayflower, and he's doing an interview for the local um, it's either the Washington Post or Washington Star correspondent. And there's a new side of Walt you didn't really see before. He was really, so let's, let's smash 
let's take the war to, to the enemy and smash them. There, there's no sympathy here. It's, I'm sure it's the all-American morale effort, but you really could see how he was advocating a different type of strategy, you know, not unlike how his, his business ventures had, had taken shifts and turns over the years. He said, um, I believe in air power, air superiority. Uh, a lot of the efforts proposed in the movie are in place today. We do have a superior air force, which was uh, established in 1947. But you, you look at Walt and um, what he was advocating is a little bit ahead of his time there. And the fact that he was able to and, and wanted to devote so many of the studio's resources to yes. this effort. Um, and it was not just because he was forced to do it or because he was paid to do it, but I think it really did come from a sense of personal patriotism that yes. Walt felt in terms of this almost a a, a personal obligation. obligation that he had yeah. in order to use the resources at his disposal to help the, the country and the government and the military any way that he could. Yeah. Yes. And, and speaking of helping the country, he was involved in war bond drives. Um, the U.S. Treasury... Um, because we are now on a war footing, had to change the tax table so that billions of Americans who were not previously taxpayers were suddenly taxpayers. And they had to soften the palate to that. So uh, they, the U.S. Treasury worked with, with Disney to create a, um, a patriotic film about your duties of paying taxes, again, featuring Donald Duck. And uh, it, it was a success. There was some bickering about the cost overruns of the production. That's government. <laughs> You know, Jamie, it's funny because as we as as I was going through the, the the going through the book and going, there are so many. What I love about the book specifically is how you touch on the connection between Disney and America in in so many different ways, right? So we talk about Walt and the government and and Lily and his personal thing. You talk about Disney in the Smithsonian and. All, yes. I mean, obviously, the the countless patents that Disney has going back to multiplane cameras and Galaxy's mm -hmm. Edge and some of the things we can see in Pandora, his connection to space. We did actually an entire show back on show 552. We talked about the connection and correlation between Disney and space so much that you can find in the Smithsonian. But I think yes. the the most intriguing part and i think sometimes one might be the most fascinating part is disney and the fbi and it's not yes. something <laughs> that you hear about or or think about but yeah. there are the stories that you tell and some of the the um the examples that you show because if you say disney and the fbi you start to think uh oh what did disney do wrong that the fbi got involved but that's Correct. not necessarily where the connection starts or ends yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a fascinating story. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, our national law enforcement agency, um, began in the early 20th century. You think of the early FBI, one name is synonymous: J. Edgar Hoover. He was um, essentially director of the FBI up until his death in the 70s. Then they did reforms to change uh, how how long you could serve. But Walt had this longstanding affinity for law and order, and, and he wanted the FBI to sort of endorse Disneyland and his Disney projects. Uh, Disneyland had Tomorrowland, wasn't fully, fully detailed out. One, some of the original uh, entries in Disneyland was like the Dairy Car, Dairy Barn by the National Dairy Barn Associated, uh, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm fumbling that, but it wasn't really Tomorrowland. <laughs> right. And, and, and Walt says proposed the future to, like dairy. So yes, yes. Yeah. So Walt proposed to the, uh, or he had an affiliate go to the Los Angeles FBI office to propose a, 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 a um, an, an FBI facility to show forensics and uh, anything in the, in crime solving. You know, this is kind of the future. This is the future of law enforcement. Uh, the FBI, Hoover, was warmed up to the idea, but it, it never fleshed out, never materialized. Walt, Walt even offered Disney, uh, uh, FBI 
members and the families lifetime passes to Disneyland. He, he really wanted to get that hook into there, that, that there was a bond. And stepping back a little bit further, when, when the development of Disneyland, Walt and his brother were scrapped for funds. They, were, they did the, the television deal with ABC to get um, funding for A, to, to pre-publicize the park and B, get some funding for it. Um, the Mickey Mouse Club shows on the air at the same time. You know, Walt says, let's do a segment on the FBI. And <laughs> Hoover <laughs> says, well, okay. He, he really wanted to be featured on the nighttime show aimed at adults. Uh, he, he didn't want to be uh, channeling uh, his resources at, at small fry, as he put it. Um, there was a lot of contentious back and forth in memos, which are, which are captured. There's, a, there's an open dossier on Walt Disney on the FBI website. You can see all the... Uh, uh, photostatic copies of, of correspondence. Um, the FBI demanded script control over the segment of uh, how they treated uh, the FBI productions. Um, they they did revisions like a 12 year old Tommy Kirkland, who was the, the Mouseketeer in charge. He's not going to be holding a gun. We're going to have the agent do that. Uh, um, and, and the FBI wanted to visually see the finished product before it was aired. And this was, you know, <laughs> Before the internet, uh, you've got to get a, a reel on a cross-country flight to do that. So um, un, under the nick of time, they, they did that. Uh, Hoover expressed some displeasure at Walt's um, court, you know, cooperation or with apparent lack of cooperation, but it ultimately came through. And uh, Walt was also named, and this is uh, a lot of people have taken interpretations on this. He was named a special agent in charge. Uh, this goes back to um, the time frame when the FBI would lean on subject matter experts in various fields. Walt was a well-known player in Hollywood, as were many others. He could be counted on to aid the FBI, as it were. Uh, a lot of people have ter- interpreted this darkly, that he was an informant. Um, I didn't see anything that clear or oblique to address that. And, and upon his death in 1966, his special agent in charge uh, title was revoked. Uh, there's a lot of correspondence between Hoover and his widow about uh, gifts and, uh, and flowers and, and, and condolences. Uh, but again, circling back to the, the off and on again relationship, Disney live action films of the early 60s includes the utterly forgettable Moon Pilot, and uh, the less uh, forgettable, but still enjoyable, that darn cat. And b- both of these featured uh, an element of government, supposedly the FBI without using the FBI logo. And they were portrayed as bumbling idiots. And uh, Roy, so not Roy, uh, Hoover was incensed. So the reviews came out and you, you can see boots written in the sidelines, like Walt must be infiltrated. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's 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 fascinating just to, to look back on that that dynamic. So Walt wanted the approval of Hoover. In some ways, he got it. In some ways, Hoover didn't uh, reconcile. Um, in the end, it's all out there in the public. It's it's uh, you can find it on the FBI website as well as my book. I think of all the stories that you tell and share in this book. This is the one that is the most eye-opening to me because this is something that you don't – there's a lot of stories about Walt and, and so many things that Walt did. You never hear in conversation about Walt Disney special agent, right? You never hear about Walt right. working for the FBI and realizing just how far and wide and how long that – that relationship went on going back to to Hoover back in in the late 30s and yes. having all these conversations about Disney's involvement in the FBI uh, again mm-hmm. if, if you look at those documents which I did after going through your book a, a lot of those are blacked out in terms of the specific yes. details but what you yes. do realize is that in return for Disney's cooperation Hoover allowed Disney to film at the bureau's headquarters and because yes. of that, and because of that relation, he's given the role of special agent, which is just mind blowing to me. <laughs> you know yes. that that, um, that he was able to do that, and then this ongoing, mutually beneficial relationship that Disney has 
with the FBI. You know, they help him acquire permits to, to build Disneyland in L.A. Like, it's it's not sort of this cloak and dagger thing, but I think it's really interesting Disney's involvement in the FBI and the FBI's involvement. Look, in, in, in Moon Pilot, you know, Hoover very much had a hand in helping to write and determine what <laughs> that script was going to be like. The yes, fact that yes. three episodes of the Mickey Mouse Club were dedicated to the FBI is remarkable to me. Um, and And the fact that these stories haven't been shared elsewhere – um, or at least ones that I haven't seen this really talked about a lot, um, I think is amazing. And I think what this does by allowing, by by giving sort of Walt this re- official relationship, I have to imagine that Walt must have felt such pride and gratitude because he loved this country so much Yes. That he really felt, because he was, he was in service to the country, all right? He was able to provide service to the country, not just through his personal patriotism, but what he was actually able to do himself and through the Disney Corporation as a whole. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's. Uh, it was a... He knew the the power of a symbiotic relationship, and 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 how to maximize his his net worth, his his capital worth, his personal value to uh, to advance the Disney brand. And I think it's 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 also interesting to think about it from the opposite side: how the governments, on multiple occasions, realized that reaching out to Disney was a way to further their goals, again, not from an entertainment perspective, but from a political perspective, which I think gives interesting light on just how powerful the government realized Walt and his voice and his vision would be to promote and further their political you know, endeavors. Yes, yes. It, it was um, this era of Walt in the 1940s. He, he's starting to peak on all of his uh, creative cylinders. And this is launching him. It's like a launch pad delivery into the uh, what will become the Disney, well, the Disneyland decade and then the 60s with the World's Fair and the uh, acquisition, the development of Disney World. Walt is at the top of his game here. And your book, I think, provides such a great, not just introduction, but really in-depth look at so many of these connections that I think a lot of us just don't even think about. I think when we think about Walt and America, uh, for a lot of people who are theme park fans, we think of Disney's America, which you talk about in your book. We've talked about it on past shows, and, and I think it was 558, we talked about the unbuilt Disney parks um, and just how and why that never really came You're right. To be. That that's a show unto itself, as, yeah. you, as you just said. Um, mm-hmm. And there are so many stories. Again, we've just touched on you know ten ish ones. And I think whether you are a Disney fan, a Walt fan, or even just a fan of or a local to DC, you make a lot of those connections to the physical location of, of the district of Columbia, as well as the, the overall government as well. Um, Walt goes to Washington is available now on Amazon. Um, rumor has it that it is also going to be coming in a Kindle version <clears throat> next year. That is correct. Um, yes. And you yes. can also find Jamie's work in celebrations magazine as well. But if Jamie, if, if they want to learn more, if they want to find out more about you, tell us where they can connect with you. Certainly. Uh, I have um, a biweekly celebrations podcast that Tim Foster does. It's a round table. Um, we're actually I'm recording in a couple of days. So he, he does a great show. It's, it's a, it's a lot of what ifs and our, you know, put on our imagineering hats and uh, it's a great time there. Uh, I am mildly active on, on Twitter at Jay Hecker. Um, I have my own personal website, kmfphotography.com. 
uh, I let off at the beginning of the show. I was I had a blood cancer diagnosis, which which moved into leukemia. I'm I'm recovering from that, but I adopted keep moving forward as my my cancer motto. Can't look back. You just got to move on till tomorrow. I have a lot of Disney and non Disney photos on that website. Um, I will uh, direct people there now. If anyone wants to have any questions about cancer care, I'm not a doctor, but you can certainly uh, DM me on Twitter if you want to ask any comments or questions about my experience. Um, I'll do one final plug. This is not for me. The Smithsonian, we didn't have a chance to cover it, but it's in the book. In 2023, they are going to have an exhibit called Mirror, Mirror for Us All. And it's going to be a reflection of Disney culture upon America and vice versa. Uh, COVID has, has set that back the timeline, but that is on, uh, it's on the calendar for a couple of years. Washington, D.C., in addition to Disney World, is a great place to visit. There's no fast, fast lines or, or lightning lanes. You got to figure that on your own. But uh, there's so much to see and do here. There's so much rich culture. Um, come out and visit. It, it should be part of every American travel bucket list. Awesome. Jamie, thank you so much, brother. Congratulations again on the book. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and sharing some of your favorite stories about Walt and Washington. Thank you, Lou. This has been a pleasure. Time for our Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details of what you see, hear, or remember. If you think you know the answer, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is once again brought to you by you. And I mean that because as part of the WW Radio Nation, you literally help bring every episode of WW Radio to life. Every live broadcast from the parks, the contests and giveaways, they're all thanks to, because of, by, for, and with you. You can find out how you can help the show for as little as a dollar per month and get cool exclusive rewards every month like scavenger hunts, trivia quests. We have group video calls every month, access to our private Facebook group, shirts, stickers, monthly care packages from Walt Disney World, early access and discounts to special events, and much more can find out how you can help the show by visiting www.radio.com slash support. Now, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, we went back in time to Tomorrowland and Walt Disney World because I said that when Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress came to Walt Disney World in 1975, what was the attraction's theme song? So first, thanks to the hundreds of you who entered, got this one correct, and it was, of course the best time of your life. Technically, it's not called Now is the Time. Now is the best time. So, quick history. The Carousel of Progress originally opened as Progress Land at the 64-65 World's Fair with the classic Sherman Brothers song There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. It then moved to Disneyland Park, was renamed the Carousel of Progress, and in 1975, the entire attraction was picked up and moved across country to a relatively empty Tomorrowland in Magic Kingdom Park. The show itself was reworked and restaged with a new theme song, The Best Time of Your Life. Why? Because sponsor General Electric didn't want people focusing on the future. They wanted them to buy General Electric appliances right now. Because now is the time, now is the best time to buy your next General Electric appliance. And if you go back and listen to show number 80 and show 135 where I interviewed Richard Sherman, he talks at length about the creation of these two songs his very clear personal favorite and why. Of course, in 1994, when Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress was reimagined once again, the original song, There's a Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, was reintroduced back into the show. Anyway, I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and you were once again playing for a WW Radio pin and keychain, which you can only get by winning a trivia contest here. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is D. Musso. So D. 
Thank you. Congratulations. I will get your prize package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. In the spirit of the season of Thanksgiving and our discussion on this week's show, I'm going to make this question a salute to all countries, but mostly America, because this week I want you to tell me exactly how many American flags are there on Main Street USA and Magic Kingdom and Walt Disney World. You have until Sunday, December 5th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there, and this week you're going to play for a copy of Jamie's book, Walt Goes to Washington. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. I sincerely appreciate you. Please don't forget to come be part of the community and conversation by joining the WW Radio Clubhouse group on Facebook at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. You can also connect with me elsewhere on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And in addition to the podcast, don't forget to join me live every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, either from the parks as we walk, talk, and ride, and eat, or the home studio where we cover our top five live Disney Plus pick of the week, your questions, contests, guests, and more. This Wednesday, I'll be live from the Epcot Festival of the Holidays throughout the day and the evening, and on Friday, a special WW Radio Live starting at 6 p.m. Eastern from Santa's favorite resort. It is the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin. We'll check out some of the holiday goings on over there, as well as maybe meet Santa and Mrs. Claus before they pack up from their vacation and head back to the North Pole. Now, one thing that's different about these and some of the past WW Radio Live broadcasts is that instead of broadcasting live on Facebook, I'm testing out broadcasting live on YouTube. I was live last week from a special viewing location for Enchantment Fireworks and Magic Kingdom. And so far, seeing that the quality is better, you're able to now watch it by sitting on your couch and just watching it on your TV. You obviously don't have to have a Facebook account. So all you need to do to get ready is just go to www.radio.com slash YouTube, subscribe and click the bell to turn on notifications, especially this week, because I will be going live throughout the day on Wednesday, as well as a special show this Friday. Again, www.radio.com slash YouTube. And please send me feedback. Let me know if you like YouTube or Facebook Live better, as I certainly want to make this the best experience for you. You can also reach out to me via email at lou at www.radio.com or send me a question that you'd like me to answer on an upcoming show. You can also call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1 with a question, a comment, or just a hello from the parks. And of course, as much as I love connecting with you online, nothing beats a handshake and a hug. So please visit our events page by going to www.radio.com slash events to find out about our next meet of the month in Walt Disney World. Our not one, not two, not three, but four upcoming cruises, including our Marvel Day at Sea in February out of Miami, our inaugural cruise on The Wish in June, our Very Merry Time group cruise on The Wish in December, and our April 2023 Disney Fantasy 8 Night overnight in Bermuda and Bahamian cruise. Again, just go to www.radio.com slash events for more information and to get a free new obligation quote. Huge thanks to some of the new and longtime members of the WW Radio Nation family. I sincerely appreciate you and your support and love and friendship and help and I love being able to give back to you each and every month. I want to thank some new and longtime members including Carly Ectenacher, Jamie Hecker, Emily Ennis, Eric Siegel, Nick Young, and Robin Norell. To find out how you can help the show for as little as a dollar a month and help our Dream Team project to benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America, thanks to you, we've raised more than half a million dollars to send kids with life-threatening illnesses to Walt Disney World. Again, just visit www.radio.com slash support. Please visit loumangelo.com to find out how I can help you turn what you love into what you do through one-on-one mentoring, or if I can come speak to your business, event, or school. You can learn more and reach out to me directly by visiting loumangelo.com. And when you're planning your next Walt Disney World, Disneyland, Disney Cruise Line, or Alani vacation, now is the time, now is the best time to reach out to our friends over at MEI and Mouse Fan Travel at mousefantravel.com. They are my official and recommended provider because it's who I use, it's who I trust, and it's why I recommend them to you for the best possible prices, all available discounts, 
all at no cost to you. But more importantly, it is an incredible level of personal care and service that they give to each and every one of their clients because they treat you as if you're a friend, as if you are family. Again, visit mousefantravel.com. And speaking of friends and family, you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not. And all I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word by sharing a link to this or your favorite episode on social, tag me at Lou Mangiello. And if you can, take just a couple of seconds to rate and review the show over an Apple podcast. It is incredibly helpful. I want to thank some recent reviewers like gjock33 who says lou does a great job with every aspect of walt disney world and other disney parks as somebody who can't get to the parks often lou makes me feel like i'm there with the podcast it also gives me a huge understanding on different disney things that i never would have known about a triple plus 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 podcast from lou and finally once again thank you thank you thank you i love and appreciate you i am so grateful to and for you and i hope that this show not just this week but every week and the live video and the community that you have helped to build and create and nurture and grow makes you happier, teaches you something, inspires you to be better and helps you remember to always choose the good, to find the good in everything, in everyone that you encounter and to spread that positivity every day to others. I promise you it makes a difference in their life as well as yours. And if there's ever anything that I can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. I hope to see you this week on the live show and right back here again next week. I love you. I appreciate you. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou, this is Mary from Peachtree Corners, Georgia. I just finished listening to your awesome top 10 boat rides in Walt Disney World. And I have a great story of an actual true event that happened to me on the Davy Crockett Canoes. We were actually, this is back in the late 70s, and we were actually hit by a Mike Fink keel boat. Our canoe tipped. We had to swim over to Tom Sawyer Island and then were promptly taken underground um, to the Utilidors where our clothes were cleaned. We wore costumes from uh, the one of the Rise in Tomorrowland, I believe, and all of our cameras, belts, wallets, everything was promptly replaced. Anyway, it was an incredible experience. I wish I could remember it a little better, but um, it really hit home talking about those um, those boats because that was the last time, of course, that I ever rode the uh, Davy Crockett canoes in the Magic Kingdom. Um Kind of interesting, for sure. But just want to also say how much I love your podcast. Look forward to it every week. Have been listening for a long time and hope that you have a fantastic Thanksgiving and know that uh, you are um, you are a fantastic, bright spot in mine and so many of our lives. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.